everybody, we continue a series of talks devoted to a fascinating field, searching of galactic axions and superconducting quantum devices. Today is the final talk of uh, this series, and it is a great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Alexey Ustinov, Professor of Experimental Physics in Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, Germany, where he has established a strong research program in the field of quantum information with superconducting qubits. Alexey has got his PhD in 1997 from the Institute of Solid State Physics, uh, Russian Academy of Science. In 1995, he has got the highest Russian degree, Doctor of Science from the same institute. Alexey main areas of expertise are experimental study of Josephson Junction and Therese in uh, classical nonlinear and quantum macroscopic regimes, superconducting quantum circuits, quantum information processing with superconducting qubits. I would like to give a floor to Professor Alexey Ustinov for his talk on exploring collective states of superconducting qubits. Welcome. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Misha, thank you for introducing me. Um, I'm glad uh, to have a chance to speak in this community in this uh, special organized seminar. So the subject of my talk, as you see on the slide, is uh, about superconducting uh, quantum systems. And this work was uh, done with uh, um, three students, mainly uh, working in different labs. So as you see, I have uh, several affiliations here. Besides uh, my main lab in Karlsruhe, uh, in my main affiliation, I have also a, a strong um, effort going on in Moscow in um, the um, Institute of uh, National Institute, University of Science and Technology, MISIS, uh, in collaboration with the Russian Quantum Center. And uh, the experiments I will show have actually been done in parallel in, in those two um, locations. So uh, the um, first slide is just introduction uh, to give you an idea where I'm coming from. I'm coming from um, Germany, as you see, it's in the corner, uh, which is very close uh, to France. So Karlsruhe is located here in the south uh, west Germany. And uh, the university uh, where I'm working is uh, actually uh, um, quite long history. It was established uh, in the uh, beginning of the 19th century. So it's soon going to be 200 years uh, to this university. It became technical school and technical university and uh, then uh, got a status of the technical university in 1967. In parallel, uh, there was a, a national lab, a German national lab located here only 10 kilometers north of Karlsruhe, uh, which was uh, actually nuclear research center, then transformed into research center of the Helmholtz Associ Association. And those two entities were merged uh, in the year uh, 2009. Uh, I was hired just a year before, came coming here with my lab from Erlangen. And uh, basically now this is a university which is uh, joining uh, the uh, uh, curriculum uh, in studying technical disciplines, um, uh, and not only technical, but also broader spectrum of higher education, and uh, working very closely with the research uh, organization of uh, Helmholtz Society. So basically, this is a, a unique example uh, here in Germany where um, research and, and, and uh, teaching really go uh, well together. So with this uh, short introduction about the place, I briefly show you a slide of what we're actually doing in my lab. Uh, we um, have uh, um, focus on superconducting quantum circuits and uh, work with superconducting qubits, uh, measure them in, uh, at low temperatures, at very low temperatures. We operate our own home-built uh, dilution cryostat and also uh, commercial uh, dry uh, dilution fridges. Um, as you see, the spectrum of topics is uh, quite broad. Uh, one speciality which I'm not going to speak about uh, is the study of uh, kind of hybrid systems uh, where we combine quantum circuits with uh, quantum states of defects. And that's the work which uh, we do in close collaboration with a uh, Google research team uh, dealing with uh, superconducting quantum uh, computing. So uh, I switch now to the subject of today. This lecture uh, will be about arrays of superconducting qubits which I like to name uh, quantum metamaterials. I will explain in a moment why. And uh, I will try to explain to you the, uh, um, uh, the difficulty of uh, actually making the uh, uh, samples for this work because 
uh, the uh, two level systems which we are working with are not natural, they are artificial and therefore they are not identical. So we need really to work hard on fabrication and also in experiment uh, to control their parameters and properties um, to make them really uh, having the characteristics which we like. And then we'll speak about two major experimental uh, works which will be on one hand, uh, the circuit QED where we study qubits coupled to a resonator, to, so single mode or multi-mode resonator. And uh, we also study more recent experiments, uh, qubits um, which are embedded in, um, in the waveguide, in one-dimensional uh, transmission line. And at the end, I will uh, sum up, um, telling uh, the, the summary of those properties, which I found really interesting. So uh, just a general uh, introduction, um, the why I like to uh, name the, this uh, race of qubits uh, quantum metamaterials. Uh, starting broadly, uh, we start from material, which is built of atoms. And uh, since uh, like two decades, uh, it became um, interesting uh, to study artificial media made of um, elements, which will be, for example, these split ring resonators or some other types of resonators having interesting um, properties in particular frequencies. In this case, uh, one deals with a, a tailored electromagnetic uh, environment and medium. Uh, however, properties are not quantum. Uh, the first twist which we um, gained by introducing superconductivity was that we uh, were able to make uh, these uh, actually artificial um, atoms, uh, so to say, but yet now classical atoms at the moment, at that moment uh, here, we uh, learned to make them superconducting and they uh, introduced, of course, a, a very low loss. Um, they became tunable in frequency and uh, also uh, gained some interesting nonlinear properties. But the most interesting, um, I think, direction here uh, in that uh, sense uh, makes uh, to study uh, quantum metamaterials. Since uh, a number of years, uh, we hear about this progress in quantum computing with superconducting qubits. And uh, in this case, one can uh, use those qubits as two level systems to build a medium with some collective properties which will behave in quantum mechanical fashion. So that's uh, basically where uh, one can use a race of, of qubits uh, to build up uh, this kind of medium. Now, let us start from um, a little broader introduction uh, into superconducting qubit. Uh, since I understand uh, on this lecture, there is also a community dealing with uh, axions and not necessarily with uh, superconducting qubits. So I'll take a little time to, uh, to give um, a broader introduction. Suppose we take now um, two favorite uh, elements uh, for circuitry, capacitor, and inductor. Uh, assuming that dissipation is, uh, is absent or small at the moment, we view this as a harmonic oscillator, which of course has a potential energy, which uh, depends on, on the um, uh, square of charge on the capacitor and uh, on the square of flux in the inductor or square of current in the inductor. So quantum mechanically, one can write this uh, as this uh, Hamiltonian here, having the charge operator and flux operator. And uh, those operators, they are conjugate, so they do not commute. And therefore one can actually expect here a quantum mechanical uh, um, properties, which uh, of course uh, require that uh, one should be able to see those levels uh, and uh, distinguish between them. However, we all know that harmonic oscillator uh, has equidistant energy levels and therefore uh, one cannot use it as a, as a qubit, uh, which requires two uh, distinct uh, energy states uh, separate from the rest uh, uh, of the states of the system. And uh, this we can get by uh, introducing instead of this inductor here, we can introduce a Josephson junction, and this Josephson junction acts as a nonlinear inductor. So, uh, classically, of course, we know that quantum um, bits are sort of uh, derived from classical bits. Uh, classical bits are uh, zero and ones, um, which are two states which a classical bit can take, encoded in the voltage levels of uh, semiconductor circuits uh, nowadays. And uh, once we um, make the potential uh, like that and consider a quantum mechanical picture, then of course uh, the lowest lying states um, will be uh, degenerate in the symmetric double well potential. And in this case, we'll have uh, actually uh, st quantum states zero and one with uh, the splitting and frequency, which is uh, given by the tunneling uh, rate between the two wells. So one can uh, see that in this kind of potential, uh, the uh, frequency separation between the states or energy separation between the states is uh, actually uh, different from um, any um, separation to any other states. Like the second state will be somewhere high up. 
And uh, this is a, a prototype uh, qubit, which uh, requ is required to perform uh, quantum computing, for instance. But here we would like to use this um, uh, kind of object really to build a medium, which is, would be some ha having some similarity to natural atomic uh, materials. So uh, let us uh, look how we can make now these, uh, these qubits uh, or how can we change this uh, LC resonator into a two-level system. Um, uh, Brian Josephson derived those uh, relations uh, back uh, over 50 years ago and telling that if you take two superconductors and have a, a barrier in between, this is a tunnel barrier made of, um, let's say, one or two nanometers of uh, oxide layer between two metallic superconductors, like aluminum, for instance. Uh, and then um, the wave functions of a superconductor will be characterized by these uh, two expressions. Uh, uh, above uh, above the, um, in the in top part of the screen. And uh, the governing variable here is the phase difference, which is the difference between the phases of the condensates on the two sides. And once uh, we send a current through this device, then this current will be uh, in the beginning superconducting when it's not too large. So it will flow without dissipation and it will be proportional to the sign of the phase difference. And that's more or less um, already tells us that actually we, we have a certain nonlinearity here. And taking into account the second Josephson relation, which tells that the voltage um, which will appear um, uh, on the junction, let's say if uh, the phase, um, if the current is changing in time or if we overcome the critical current, this voltage will be proportional to the time derivative of the phase difference. Now, if we differentiate the first equation here, we see that we'll get here the, the cosine of phi and the time derivative of the phase difference. Actually, we can introduce here a relation between the time derivative um, um, of the current and the voltage. And the proportionality coefficient is the, uh, as we all know, uh, from electro, um, um, uh, electro electrical engineering, this is a, uh, an inductance. So this inductance uh, is actually given by this expression here. And we see that the inductance becomes uh, depending on the uh, phase difference on the junction. So, it, uh, minimum value is given by this expression here, a flux quantum divided by two pi critical current. But uh, if we increase this current, this inductance will also increase. And this gives uh, this, um, this essential nonlinearity um, of uh, this kind of device, which allows us to build uh, quantum circuits uh, with properties uh, similar to spin one half systems or uh, qubits or atoms. So one example uh, here is uh, the so-called flux, flux qubit, which was uh, um, brought up by uh, Hans Moen collaborators back over 20 years ago. And this is a circuit consisting of a superconducting loop with three Josephson junctions. So two junctions are nominally identical, and the third junction is slightly smaller than the other two. And uh, with these conditions, we could uh, write the flux quantization in the loop, summing up three phases, uh, phase differences on the junctions. And then introducing uh, here the winding number of fluxoid winding number, which will be um, due to the fact that the phase uh, is uh, single defined in, in any point of a superconductor. So if we go around this loop, the phase can only change by integer number of two pi's. And um, excluding uh, setting uh, n to zero and then excluding the uh, third phase here, uh, we could write the energy of the system as uh, uh, expressed in terms of uh, the phase difference phi one and phi two. And uh, this cosine comes from the phi three, uh, included from this expression. So basically, this allows us to plot the energy landscape of the system, depending on the two phases, phi one and phi two. And if we uh, see this landscape, there are some maxima here, and there are some minima. And if we do the cross cut along this line here, then you see slightly um, darker areas here. And those slightly darker areas are two local minima. Uh, which are separated by a very uh, gentle, a very um, small um, barrier between, which actually allows, uh, uh, if you put uh, down the numbers, allows uh, actually to treat the system quantum mechanically that uh, the barrier is actually given by the uh, coefficient alpha here, and uh, the, uh, it can be controlled by this alpha and becomes um, actually, the whole circuit becomes a quantum two-level system. So uh, another example is the so-called transmond qubit. In this case, uh, we um, basically use this cosine relation of the Josephson uh, uh, energy depending on the phase. And then uh, if the Josephson energy is small enough, and um, then uh, we could also control the effective mass of this quantum system. So by changing the capacitance, basically it uh, boils down to the potential, which I show here on dependence of phase. And then there will be energy levels in this potential 
with the lowest line level being at the bottom of this minimum. And since this potential unharmonic is unharmonic, um, it's not exactly uh, the same uh, distance between zero and one and one, two. So there will be slight harmonicity here by this, um, given by this cosine. And this uh, harmonicity uh, can be uh, treated gen uh, kind of carefully so that if one do doesn't drive the system too hard by applying the, for example, microwave radiation between the uh, two energy levels here, then one will not address uh, the state two or three, but will basically stay in this uh, lowest two levels and handling it as a, uh, as a quantum two level system. And this device is shown here. It looks a bit uh, um, um, appealing. Um, the chances are here, but this uh, kind of uh, this finger capacitance, which is made in this kind of devices typically is uh, coming from the fact that one needs to tune the capacitance to slightly larger value than the capacitance of the junction itself uh, to form this kind of potential. So this device was proposed um, by Yale group uh, over 10 years ago and became a favorite superconducting qubits, which is now built, uh, used to build uh, quantum processors by um, IT companies as Google, um, IBM, and, um, and others. So um, there is a whole uh, zoo of superconducting qubits. <clears throat> so I already introduced to you briefly flux qubit and this transmon. There are also some other devices uh, which I didn't talk about, like the uh, very tiny transmon could be viewed as a charge qubit without chanting capacitance. And there is also phase qubit. That's basically when you bias the uh, junction with the current, you tilt the cosine potential and so forth. So I'm not going into uh, great detail about that. And uh, basically I will focus today on uh, two devices which I introduced on flux qubits and on transmon qubits. So uh, what we are going to look at will be uh, two types of experiments. First experiment, as I already mentioned in the introduction, will be KVT QED experiment, where we have a, uh, a coplanar waveguide resonator uh, sitting on, uh, on the chip on dielectric substrate. So the signal line is in the middle here. This is this ground electrodes here on, on top and bottom. And then superconducting qubits are sitting somewhere here. Then the, uh, they can, can be coupled either capacitively or inductively uh, to the, um, uh, to the um, uh, electromagnetic field in the resonator. And then these gaps here, they sort of um, determine the coupling of the resonator to the rest of the world. And we can measure either transmission or reflection from this resonator. Another example um, is the, uh, um, the waveguide QED, where we basically uh, form a one-dimensional waveguide um, for example, as a coplanar um, um, line here, uh, shown here. And also we could place the qubits there uh, next to each other. They could be coupled only through the transmission line, for example, not talk to each other. And then uh, the distance between the qubits can be made uh, depending on our wish, either comparable with the wavelengths or uh, being kept uh, much smaller than the wavelengths. So far, we looked mostly at the uh, lamped uh, limit where the distance between the qubits have been actually um, smaller than the wavelengths, which is the limit of a metamaterial uh, because the objects have to be sort of smaller, uh, much smaller than the wavelengths in a, in a metamaterial. This is a difference from, for example, photonic crystals. All right, um, so um, very briefly, a uh, theoretical picture here. Uh, so the KVT QED has been used uh, in atomic physics and won Nobel Prize, Serge Harosh. Uh, got the uh, uh, Nobel Prize in 2012 uh, for um, atomic experiments uh, on tangling photons and atoms. And this is the ansatz, which is described by the James Cummings Hamiltonian shown here. Um, basically you have an atom sitting in a cavity and then um, this uh, atom forms kind of a coupled state with the cavity. And then um, even if the, uh, when the state of the, um, of the cavity is changed and the photon arrives there, this photon can be sort of uh, detected uh, and, and seen by the, um, um, by the uh, qubit and other way around. So the qubit is, for example, is this two level system excited uh, from the ground state to the excited state, then the frequency of the, of the cavity uh, changes slightly. It translates into the uh, splitting of the uh, first excited state into uh, the uh, two states, which will be the superposition states of the uh, atom and the cavity. If you put now many identical atoms in the cavity, uh, then uh, the system is described by the Tavis Cummings um, Hamiltonian, and then uh, the uh, splitting of the brightest mode uh, where all the qubits separate, uh, all the atoms uh, are sort of uh, uh, excited in, in the same way, uh, have the same um, um, components of the eigenvectors. 
basically, um, the coupling of that state uh, goes up as a square root of a number of uh, atoms. So this uh, actually uh, tells that uh, the effect of a single atom can be amplified, so to say, by putting many of atoms together, and then the splitting, uh, which can be used, for example, for detecting, detecting the excited, excited state of the ensemble, goes up as a square root of n. Um, another theoretical model which um, uh, is related to the experiments which I will show is the waveguide QED. And here we have uh, um, Hamiltonian uh, where we describe the system by uh, summing up of, uh, of the contributions of all the two level systems. Then we have a continuum of the modes of the waveguides here. Uh, basically there are no um, individual modes, it's, it's just very um, broad energy. Uh, and frequency spectrum. And then we have uh, basically the, uh, the qubits uh, interacting with the photons in the waveguide via the dipole moments. These dipole moments in the circuits we can um, design um, at wish. So that's actually where the difference comes from atomic physics here. First is that we could uh, increase the interaction making the space one dimensional, really one dimensional waveguide. And second is that um, we could uh, at wish make these dipole moments really large. So we could very strongly couple um, these two level systems uh, to the modes propagating in the waveguide. And that's really an uh, experimental um, uh, possibility, which uh, offers, of course, uh, amazing challenge also to theory, which was not really explored in atomic physics in the past. So uh, the uh, um, instructive step here is to integrate out the photonic degrees of freedom and basically rewrite this uh, in this uh, form here where we have no photons anymore, but just have interacting qubits. And uh, basically the photons um, uh, introduce um, actually or uh, mediate the interactions which have uh, uh, infinite range. And there are two types of uh, sort of uh, uh, interactions here, two flavors. Uh, first one is the uh, collective decay, uh, which is uh, described here by, by this uh, rate here. Uh, and uh, depends, of course, on the distance between the qubits. And uh, the second is the uh, exchange interaction, uh, which appears as a second term. And um, uh, having this um, theoretical introduction, I will mention that actually the quantum metamaterials arrays of qubits have been um, uh, first uh, sort of uh, uh, coined in theory. I, I, I think the first paper, maybe well, the very first paper was a paper by Zagoskin and co-authors, um, uh, Rachmanov and co-authors, back in 2008. And then this was followed by a number of theoretical proposals. And um, here there were several effects predicted as uh, super and subradiance, band gap uh, appearance. One can use uh, these metamaterials to store um, light as um, people do in atomic physics in uh, quantum memories. One can generate non-classical photons. So one can uh, try to uh, mimic uh, lasing. And also there have been several proposals uh, to single photon detection. Uh, actually, single photon detection, I assume, is interesting for this community here. Um, and that's a subject of uh, our uh, project in, in Europe, uh, led by Mikhail Lysitsky from Naples. Uh, basically, um, attempt to uh, observe um, the, or to use the uh, qubit arrays to detect uh, microwave photons um, associated with, uh, with axions. So, um, now, uh, going back to the subject of my talk, I'm not going to speak about that. We, are, we are just started working on this and this is not uh, yet uh, really done. What I'm going to review is really um, the spectrum of experiments with uh, arrays of qubits. And uh, experimental challenge here is uh, making um, nearly identical qubits. That's really uh, rather difficult. So the first experiment which was done in this field was um, our experiment here in Karlsruhe in collaboration with uh, the Moscow group and Yena Yevgeny um, Lichov, uh, who I assume is also in this uh, in seminar now. So basically uh, the uh, experiment was using a resonator to couple uh, 20 flux qubits deposited on the same substrate. And flux qubits are uh, devices, which I already explained to you. They have three Josephson junctions and they are very small, having very small dimensions. So they are in the sub micrometer scale and making all of them identical is, is very uh, difficult. So you really need to rely on the lithography um, accuracy and then all the differences in dimensions of the junctions and other properties uh, uh, introduce exponentially large spread. Nevertheless, we were able to observe the first signatures of collective behavior. We saw that in the spectrum of, this, uh, of, uh, of, the, um, of the system, which is uh, mapped to the spectrum of single qubit, we observed avoided level crossing of the resonator with the, um, uh, with the qubit. 
ensemble. And the size of the splitting was proportional to the square root of n. From the size of the splitting, we could deduce the, um, uh, the uh, um, um, number of qubits which were operating in bright collective modes. And uh, this number was eight qubits. And then after some time, we saw a dissociation of the of this eight qubits into eight qubits, uh, into four and four qubits, sorry. Uh, well, this was the very first experiment. Of course, we could not control much uh, in that experiment. And uh, we uh, then uh, we'll come back to this uh, uh, actually in the next slides. So in the following experiments. Another example, um, which we used here um, to uh, do a similar experiment was actually an array of transmon qubits. So flux qubits were coupled to the um, antinode of a current in the uh, resonator. Here we couple the qubits into the uh, antinode of the uh, um, of the voltage in the resonator. So they couple to the electrical field basically. And this uh, um, this is the transmission line here uh, going from one side to another. This is a resonator which has here an open end and basically the um, uh, qubits are coupled to the um, uh, open end uh, of the resonator which means to the electrical field. All these qubits were um, located here. They were uh, in number as you, as you see, they were comparable uh, to the uh, uh, qubits we had before, uh, roughly, uh, let's say, 20. And uh, then we also were able to, uh, to see uh, uh, here again several clusters of synchronized uh, transmon qubits. From the uh, dispersive shift of the resonator, we were able to deduce here the uh, cluster of uh, six transmons. And also we were able to uh, see the uh, behavior of this cluster in collective wave. So we saw that uh, we could also excite multi-photon transitions of uh, um, this cluster into the excited states at the second and third qubit level collectively. And then interestingly, we were able also to see here uh, a, a splitting between a single qubit, which was having a different frequency from the cluster and uh, the cluster as a whole. So this all uh, interpretation, of course, was uh, not aimed when we were planning the experiment. We had not, not really many means, uh, sufficient means of, of control. And therefore, it's obvious the qubits which we could make could not be identical um, just because of uh, fabrication reasons and also because of uh, uh, slightly different environment. They are not the same as atoms uh, which Mother Nature makes for us. So therefore, we have to do some effort to make them, uh, if we want, of course, um, looking identical. And this was uh, done later uh, in a paper, which uh, actually was an archive uh, since 2018, but then it was sort of delayed because of uh, student finishing and appeared in Fizref Applied only this year. Here we have done experiment again with uh, transmon qubits, but now transmon qubits were um, placed uh, uh, in the resonator from two sides. As you see here, the resonator was open, having open end here and open end here. Uh, this is the uh, uh, the gap of the resonator, as you see. We make it uh, by purpose here in controlled lengths to, to, to control the coupling. And then on two sides of this um, uh, open end resonator, here and there, there was a qubit. Uh, so the junction uh, two junction loop uh, is, is this uh, this loop here. This is a capacitor. And these two large bars, they, they control the dipole moment of the qubit, which is coupled to the resonator. And then you see these uh, control lines here, which were used to control the flux in the loop in the squid loop of a transmon qubit. So by doing this, we were able to change the native frequency of this, um, this qubit uh, in individual way. And we had here eight flux lines. So actually we could tune the qubits one by one into the uh, desired frequency and then study the collective properties uh, one by one um, when we increase the number of qubits tuned to the same frequency as they form sort of a collective bright state. And uh, here we uh, could not avoid uh, actually a crosstalk between the flux lines. So only when we tune one uh, flux line, also the neighboring qubits are changing their frequency. So before actually doing the experiment, we need to measure this uh, eight times eight mutual inductance matrix and then diagonalize it. And then uh, by having this sort of vector of the control currents uh, of, uh, of these eight qubits, we were able to make individual tuning of the qubits. So, uh, here we show uh, on this slide the square root of n nonlinearity when we tune uh, qubits one by one into the collective resonance. So here we see that uh, with one qubit, we have the splitting of a G of uh, 114 megahertz. If we do now um, the, uh, the two qubits to this frequency, then the splitting increases. And as we tune the qubits one by one, as you see, we could actually uh, observe uh, quite nicely 
uh, dependence, which was uh, uh, depicting this square root of n. We could measure uh, well the last qubit with number six and also could not measure uh, seven and eight qubits due to the noise in the system. So in this first experiments, the filtering of the flux lines was not sufficient uh, to resolve uh, the states of many qubits due to the many lines interfering and contributing to the noise. This we improved in the future. And actually, uh, currently we have an experiment going on where we have uh, over 20 qubits, which we could tune uh, to, the, to the same frequency. Um, now let me switch over to experiments uh, you know, with a waveguide uh, with an uh, open uh, transmission line. As before, we uh, shine microwave on one side and then we um, take the microwave out on the other side and we measure the transmission. We could also measure the reflection if you want. And here, uh, the uh, phenomena were, which, which are expected from qubits are rather interesting. They were pioneered, studied here by Alek Astafiev and collaborators around 2010. So basically single qubits in transmission line um, takes the photons uh, from which are incident on the qubit, but it doesn't absorb the qubit, it re-emits it back. Uh, and basically uh, a qubit in transmission line um, coupled sufficiently strongly can lead to nearly 100% extinction, basically emitting back every uh, photon which comes to it. Of course, if we increase the, uh, the rate of photons coming, then the qubit cannot take more than one photon and then the saturation is observed. So here in this particular example, we had 90 qubit uh, metamaterial uh, in the waveguide. In this first experiment uh, with uh, many qubits, we did not control their frequencies. We coupled them very strongly uh, to the transmission line, having the T1 um, limited by the uh, um, free decay in transmission line of 18 nanoseconds. And the total length was about uh, three wavelengths here. It's, it's really long arrays, you see. And uh, the thing which we could observe, or we would expect here, is the formation of the band gap. So when we add qubits one by one, they interact collectively and form um, a whole band um, where the uh, transmission of, uh, of microwave is not possible. Uh, of course, at low power limit, because we have a nonlinear system, we have actually a quantum system, quantum two level system. Uh, each uh, qubit cannot take more than one photon and therefore uh, this property of the band gap uh, is expected to show the saturation. So these are some simulation results with different disorder, but I will not go in detail at that point. So uh, this plot shows the power dependence of the, uh, uh, trans uh, of the uh, transmission coefficient S1 to uh, one um, through this array of qubits. And uh, here we see that there is a broad band here formed around five gigahertz where there is no transmission. And this band is, is exactly this uh, band gap, which I was speaking about with some disorder. So you see some qubits are actually not in, in resonance with others. Uh, this particular qubit here is strongly off resonance. And we see that this, that this, that this qubit has a, um, a suppression of transmission, this extinction basically of uh, no microwaves passing through at low power, but then it saturates here at about minus 120 dBm. And that's the power referred to the, uh, um, to the circuit. And when we increase the, um, the power, we also see the saturation of uh, the ensemble of qubits, but at power which is uh, roughly 18 uh, dB larger. And from this power, we estimate that actually the number of participating qubits in this band gap is around 60 to 70. So this nonlinearity actually tells that we are not dealing here with uh, linear resonators, but really deal here with a quantum system, uh, which, has, uh, which cannot absorb any, any, um, uh, any, any more than a single photon for the transition between the ground state and the first excited state. So uh, having uh, no means of control uh, in this, this experiment uh, led us to, the, to follow up uh, with less number of qubits, but now with better control. Similarly, as we have done with resonators, here we have transmission line um, when we send the signal from left to right, and then uh, have eight qubits sitting here uh, around, this, around this transmission line. The design is slightly modified, but it's just for um, properly uh, um, hitting the parameters. So the um, uh, single qubit uh, uh, T1 time was uh, given by 25 nanoseconds, determined by the strengths of, of coupling, um, electric dipole coupling or electric capacitive coupling between the transmission line and, and the qubits. And uh, we mitigated uh, the, uh, the flux crosstalk by using a particular uh, design here of the circuit. So the crosstalk was, was there, but it was much, uh, uh, much less than in the previous experiment. So the key improvement here was that we have frequency tunable qubits as we also had in the, in the work with the um, eight qubit resonator. 
And um, here we again observe uh, very nicely that when we tune the qubits one by one to the same frequency, then we observe the saturation power. So this is the power dependence of the um, S uh, to one coefficient here as a function of frequency. And this minimum here, this duck area is the uh, qubit frequency, which saturates at certain uh, power. And the saturation power was measured in the uh, middle, middle of the slope. This is a cross cut for this line here. So when we increase the number of qubits, which we tune to the same frequency, then the saturation power basically increase uh, linearly. So uh, basically we add photons one by one um, uh, with increasing uh, the power and uh, the qubits cannot uh, take more than eight photons altogether when the eight qubits are sitting on the resonator. So basically this tells that we really um, have this uh, quantum nonlinearity and the situation shows the collective dynamics. But let's now uh, look for something more interesting which is beyond that. Okay, this is another plot which shows the saturation power. Now you see the uh, actually the frequency plot on the same um, scale here for a single qubit and for eight qubits tuned in the resonance. And you see that uh, instead of a single um, line here, which is the extinction of a single qubit, we observe here, observe here a band gap. And inside this band gap, we also have some very interesting uh, features, which uh, I'm going to discuss uh, in the next, uh, next two slides. Um, so uh, the, this feature is the appearance of the duck states. If we plot now uh, the uh, transmission, this is the, um, um, the, um, the, 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 the S to one parameter, the absolute value of the S to one parameter is a function of frequency. And uh, the appearance of the band gap when we tune uh, qubits one, one by one to resonance, uh, we observe here two qubits, three qubits, four qubits and eight qubits. And here, even for a single qubit, we have this asymmetric line, which is expected from theory, and then uh, as, as, a, as the emergence of the band gap. And then this little corner is the appearance of this duck state. The duck state basically is a state where qubits are not uh, having the same angle vectors, and therefore, to excite the, the duck state, you need certain symmetry breaking. So the, uh, the, the, the excitation uh, takes place due to the uh, non-perfection of, uh, of our design. For example, our system is uh, comparable with the wavelengths and therefore we could excite um, these duck states also one by one uh, by increasing uh, the number of qubits and also uh, by changing the power. So uh, we see that uh, the, this duck state, which appeared here, uh, has a certain line width. So the analysis of the um, of lifetime of these duck states is given in this paper. If you're interested, please have a look. And uh, I will just mention here that uh, we observe uh, this major duck state, uh, the, the brightest duck state, and also the, the other states which we analyze in these uh, uh, plots and com compare also with the uh, numerical simulations uh, using the Lindblad model. So um, we could understand the properties of the system rather well. We observe um, this um, uh, plot in the experiment where we have uh, seven qubits on the resonance and then we the tune through the qubit number eight through this resonance. And here we measure the reflection. Pay attention, this is not uh, the uh, transmission, but reflection S2, uh, S2 2, S, S, S was one, 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 depending how you name, name the ports. And basically uh, this line uh, of the qubit eight basically disappears at the crossing point. And this is also represented very well by calculation uh, using the uh, um, density matrix simulation. So um, the other quantum feature, which we also could observe uh, in a collective way in this, uh, this system is the autoton splitting, which is characteristic of atomic two level system. Basically here, you have a control tone, which you apply uh, to drive the transition between one and two levels. And then you increase the power of the, um, of the transmission at the frequency of the, uh, um, of the major uh, transition between zero and one. And basically, the, there is an uh, appearance of this autoton split, splitting, which has been also observed previously on single qubits in transmission line by Alek Astafiev and um, um, uh, Abdul Farouk Abdumalikov in this paper. And um, basically, it also offers an opportunity to do things like known from atomic physics. For example, do the slow light and, and uh, use the quant this, this state as a quantum memory here. So we actually were able in experiments, which I don't show yet, the papers in preparation, uh, we were able to observe the slowing of light by a factor of uh, one and a half thousand in this array of qubits by using the electromagnetically uh, induced transparency in a similar manner as uh, with atomic uh, systems. So with that, I would like to uh, conclude. I think my, my time is about 40 plus um, uh, minutes already. 
So um, I told you about uh, arrays of superconducting qubits, uh, which uh, uh, actually is a, um, a nice, very nice opportunity to make um, experiments with uh, artificially made uh, metamaterials of quantum nature. We could uh, couple these metamaterials uh, and arrays to a resonator and observe a collective uh, dynamics of, uh, um, um, of qubits. Um, where they show uh, enhanced coupling to the uh, resonators. And actually, I would mention that this is the idea of using the collective states, the idea which can be also explored further uh, to build single photon detection, which will be more efficient than a single photon qubit detection in circuit QED. But that's still a matter of, uh, of this uh, project, which we entered recently with uh, project partners also present in this uh, seminar today. And uh, the other uh, fascinating field, which I think is really very rich and interesting, is the arrays of qubits uh, in one-dimensional waveguides, where we could tune the transparency of the array by uh, tuning qubits in resonance. We could observe band gap engineering. We could slow light there and make the interaction between the photons uh, and qubits arbitrarily strong. So that's really very exciting. Uh, direction, which also offers generation of non-classical light, for example, entangling the propagating light with qubits. So the, the light pulse, which will propagate through this array of qubits, will come out uh, in a certain uh, non-classical state, which can be uh, then tailored by controlling the states of, of the qubits. And I should mention that experiments uh, with uh, arrays were done by several students. Uh, they were mentioned in the uh, in the papers. I will name Kirill Kulshulga, who did um, one of the first experiments uh, with an uh, array of um, um, of um, uh, transmons, is, and who actually is working now as a postdoc in the Supergalax project in our group here in Karlsruhe. And the experiments with the uh, transmission line were done by um, uh, Jan Brem, uh, who will graduate uh, very soon uh, on this uh, um, our, um, waveguide QED with qubit arrays. With this, I would like to, to stop and um, leave uh, you time for questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Let's thank our speaker. And, uh, and the floor is open for questions from the audience. I see Sasha Zagoskin on the screen. He certainly has a question. <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> actually, I have a pretty trivial question. Does it matter which qubit you are putting off resonance in one in this picture where you have seven in resonance and one driven? Uh, it does matter. So they are not all identical. They are sitting in different locations relative to the wavelengths. And in the, in the recent experiment. Um, uh, which I mentioned briefly, which is done uh, in Moscow by uh, Ilya Bisenin and, 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 and co-authors when we tune 20 qubits to resonators. We really see that we need to make averaging of our ensemble uh, by choosing uh, the qubits which we tune to the resonance in a random way. If we don't do this, then our curve is much more bumpy than we expect uh, to see uh, in, in from statistics. But that's a new work which I didn't speak about where we detune the qubits deliberately from resonance and then observe the collective state disappearance uh, when the qubits are having large dispersion. Okay, and uh, another question is, is it possible uh, to tune effective coupling between the qubits uh, to make uh, the system more stiff, so to speak? Well, in the simple version of the circuit um, design, I think is going to be really difficult. So uh, there is a way to make tunable coupling between qubits or tunable coupling between qubit and resonator. But this requires extra circuit elements, which will be the couplers. So the coupler can be controlled then uh, by another control circuit. Then it actually becomes really very complicated um, yeah. design. So I think with uh, maybe having two qubits or three qubits and three couplers, this might work, but otherwise uh, it really becomes very, um, uh, very complicated um, circuit. Okay, but thank you. In general, it's possible, yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, any more? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for Alexei for the nice uh, presentation. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I have some uh, some questions. Uh, Alexey, you, you are talking about the uh, two-dimensional uh, resonator. Yes. Uh, can you uh, speak some uh, briefly some uh, uh, experimental activity in the field of the free di free dimensional resonator? Do you know some, some experimental activity? Yeah, well, I spoke about uh, the uh, one-dimensional resonators because we have one-dimensional yes. resonator line. And yes, there, yes. Is a, uh, there is a work going on in the group of, um, um, of Gerhard Kirchmeier in, uh, in Innsbruck, who is working uh, with arrays of qubits uh, placed in a three-dimensional um, waveguide. And also you could, uh, I mean, they also work uh, in a similar way with um, three-dimensional resonators. So the three-dimensional three resonators for qubits have been brought up um, by uh, Yale group and followed now by several uh, groups in the world. Um, they offer um, much uh, higher coherence of qubits than uh, the planar structures, which I was, uh, planar architecture, which I spoke about. And uh, one can even build uh, quantum um, um, gates between the qubits in, in different fashion. Um, so yes, I think one can uh, use three-dimensional resonator actually to form um, also quantum metamaterial uh, with qubits. And even one can even choose the uh, qubits uh, on different substrates and form a stack of substrates uh, to choose, so to, so to say, identical ones. What is difficult to three-dimensional resonators is to control the frequency of qubit because if you bring any wire into, inside the three-dimensional re resonator, it changes uh, very strongly uh, the parameters of resonators. So you have, don't have those two dimensions which we use in one-dimensional resonators to do all the controls which we need. So the answer is yes, but uh, I don't think it's, uh, really um, having um, all the uh, uh, flexibility of, of experimental toys as we have with uh, one-dimensional resonators. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And another question is about the uh, tuning of, uh, of the uh, qubit uh, in your um, experiment. For example, if you have a eight, uh, eight, uh, array of eight qubit, uh, can you uh, tell uh, uh, roughly the uh, deviation uh, of the uh, frequency uh, between the qubit? So how, uh, 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 how, uh, how, what, uh, uh, how uh, how do you uh, how do you uh, tune the uh, the qubit the deviation between the all qubit this is my mm -hmm. question well in, in, the, in, in terms of in terms of uh, frequency yes uh, in the experiments with flux qubits um, we have uh, uh, seen that our uh, deviation is roughly 20 percent so uh, this is the, 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 the half uh, width of the, uh, let's say, the, uh, the width of the uh, uh, distribution if we use Gaussian for, uh, for evaluating that. Now with uh, transmon qubits, uh, the junction is slightly larger and um, um, one can control this in a bit better way. So um, the uh, uh, dis distribution of uh, or deviation of frequencies for the array of transmons which I showed uh, this 90 transmons, which, which I showed in the, in the talk, um, I would say roughly, I would guess it was in the range uh, between five and 10%, closer to 5%. But we cannot tell, tell exactly. We can see that actually we observed the band gap, which was only um, um, like below 10% of, uh, of the frequency. And this gap was certainly collective. So we assume that actually uh, the, the, the width was, the, the spread was uh, between five and 10%. Thank you very much uh, for the answer and also for the nice uh, presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Michel. Hey. Uh, Alexey, yeah. uh, for measurements at low power, do you use parametric amplify or this is just a lot of averaging for semiconductor one? Uh, in the experiments which I showed, uh, we don't use a parametric amplifier. So we were using the conventional hemp amplifiers. But of course, one, commercial one, yeah. For yeah, the, which uh, one? You, yeah, this is noise. a low noise factory, right? Low noise factory, yes. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. Are there any more questions or comments from the audience? Well, it doesn't seem like, so let us all thank our speaker once again for this wonderful talk.
Thank you. And with that, I would like to officially thank you all for joining in, and this will be the end of our PCS seminar. So thank you all.